Welcome everyone to today's webinar, Everyone Out Safely, Understanding the Safe Egress of Persons with Limited Mobility During Emergencies. Today's webinar is facilitated by the Loop Fall Prevention Community of Practice. My name is Michelle Dukeman. I am the Knowledge Translation Coordinator for the Fall Prevention Program at Parachute. Uh, and Parachute now sponsors the Fall Prevention Communities of Practice Loop and Loop Junior, along with the annual Fall Prevention Month campaign. Uh, before we begin, we'd like to get started today with a land acknowledgement. Today, we respectfully acknowledge the land on which we live and work as the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Indigenous peoples, Canada's First Nations, Inuit, Mate and Métis people, whose presence reaches back to ancestral time. We respect and affirm the inherent rights and title of Indigenous people of Canada, and declare our respect of Indigenous elders, past, present, and future. Just want to ask that everyone takes a moment to themselves just to acknowledge the land where they currently reside. Next, I'm going to cover a few housekeeping items. During the webinar, if you have questions about the technology, please type them into the chat box. Uh, my colleague Marguerite will be monitoring this. And if you have any questions specifically for our presenters about the webinar and the content, please submit them through the Q&A box. They're going to be answered at the end of the webinar, um, and you'll only be able to view the questions that you have asked and not the questions posed by other participants. Um, like Marguerite mentioned in the chat, um, the webinar is being recorded and a YouTube link will be sent to all participants in about one week along uh, with the presentation slides. And you can view previous webinar recordings simply by heading over to uh, the webinar page on Loop uh, and clicking on uh, archived webinars. We also have a YouTube channel where you can watch them. I'm gonna now introduce our presenters, Jim Kloss, National Director at Age Safe Canada, and Dr. Tilak Dutta, a scientist at the Kite Research Institute, the research arm of the Toronto Rehabilitation Institute at University Health Network. For a complete bio on our presenters, uh, please take a look at the Loop event calendar. You'll see uh, all the information that you're looking for there. So without further ado, please take it away, Tilak. You uh, may now share your screen. Great, thank you so much, Michelle. Just switch over to my slides. Here we go. Great. Yeah, well, uh, let me just see if I can drag this over here. Is everyone able to, no, I guess you can't see that, can you? Hang on one second. Let me share that one more time by doing this. There we go. Great, okay, thank you, um, Michelle. Uh, for organizing this and to Loop for organizing Parachute and for Jim for the idea that we should hold this webinar. I think it's an important topic. I'm really excited to be here and to see so many people online on the line today. Uh, so many familiar uh, names I see, so that's great to see. Um, so I'm gonna jump right to the punchline because your time is valuable. I just wanna get to the takeaway messages and then expand on them a little bit. The first one is that we, as a, as a society, we've been doing a pretty good job of focusing on improving accessibility over the past few decades, 20 or 30 years. We've made it easier for people to get into buildings, but we've ignored the, what happens in the event of an emergency if, largely if we lose power or we don't have the ability to use an elevator in the event of a fire, if that's how the rule is set up. Um, it gets very difficult to get people out of buildings in those emergency situations. And so we need to focus, some people call this egressibility. That's what I've been referring it to as, is, is getting people with disabilities out of a building in the event of an emergency. We know right now that if you, are, if you do have um, a disability, you're at an eight times higher risk of injury or death during the, during, uh, the emergency. And so it's pretty easy to see that we are not providing an equal life safety for all, which is um, a principle that both I think Ontario and Canada have as part of their human rights legislation, but we're, we're quite far from achieving that right now. I think most people would agree. 
The second take home message is that I think this problem actually impacts more people than, than you may think um, on, on the face of it. Uh, you know, we hear the statistic that, um, or at least I've heard this statistic quite often, something one in five, something around one in five people have a disability in our society. Um, but if you think a little bit deeper and you read the stories of people who have been through an emergency scenario, or you think about your families, you know, they're, it's not only the individual with the disability that's affected, but it's their families, their friends, their neighbors, their colleagues, the people they work with, who in most cases would not leave the individual in an emergency situation to fend for themselves. They would stay to help and figure out a way to get them um, to safety. And so we can't look at this through the lens of only the, the individuals, but also the broader community that supports them. I think from my own perspective, I think about my mom who lives on the 18th floor of a building um, and she she recently had a knee replacement and so now she's more mobile, but before that she would not have said that she had a disability. And she probably, if she was by herself in the event of an emergency in her building, she could probably get down the stairs. She would move slowly, but she could probably get out, the, uh, out of the building um, if she was on her own, but but I would think uh, that she would have real trouble if she was babysitting my son, for instance, uh, particularly if she uh, before he was able to walk. You know, and there were times when we would drop uh, our son off with her uh, for for babysitting, and um, and I never really considered before I got into this what would have happened in an emergency situation had something, had there been a fire or some other emergency in the building. But I think it would have been very difficult for her to get both of them out of the building safely. And, um, and so this is, you know, these are the kinds of, I, I think we need to think broader about the types of people that, that, um, that we have to think about how they would react in, in different emergencies. Um, the third takeaway message is we should keep in mind that there are two broad approaches for, uh, for dealing with getting people out, keeping people safe in an emergency. One is considered this protect in place approach. The other one is the everybody out approach. And the protect in place approach is the one that's most commonly in place in our jurisdictions here in Ontario. Um, but we know that ever since really the um, really 9-11 uh, in 2001, September 11th, th there's been a lot of discussion that protect in place is not a good approach. And, and to give a bit more detail on this one, protect in place means that someone with a disability goes to a safe refuge in the building, uh, a, an area that is protected uh, where first responders can come and rescue them. Um, the alternative, so, so for instance, in our, in our national building code, this is how it's shown, and, and these would occur sometimes in stairwells. Um, so you can have these safe refuges in the fire stairs, an area where, where individuals with disabilities are, uh, that's, that's set aside for people to be able to go and wait for help to come to them. The first, uh, I mean, there's a, there's a number of problems with this. Uh, the, you know, obvious ones being the time it takes someone to get to them. Um, and the second one is how much space is there? Uh, again, thinking back to someone maybe not being alone when they're going to a safe refuge, uh, imagining that there might be more than one person that needs to, you know, more than two people. You can see there's enough space here for two people to wait in this refuge space, but what happens if there's more than those two people there? Uh, where do they go? Uh, it can slow down the flow of people uh, down the down the rest of the stairs, uh, and also the fact that, that what we learned from 9/11 um, was people that waited in the safe refuges, uh, many of them died. Those that took an elevator to get out, even though I don't think they were supposed to, they weren't designed that way, uh, did survive. Um, so that's why there's been a movement to recognizing that the everybody out approach is the better approach and, and the approach that we should probably be thinking about as we design new standards uh, for uh, egressibility. Um, so two solutions that you might consider under the everybody out scenario is, is allowing, as I mentioned, occupants to use elevators to 
evacuate. Uh, the other one that Jim is going to get into far more detail about is uh, the use of an evacuation chair as another example. Um, in our building code and just another page of our building code the, the, that shows that we actually do have signage and things that do allow for uh, the self-operated evacuation elevator to be used right now in Canada. Um, I already mentioned the issue of September 11th, 2001. A lot of there, there was a lot of discussion and reporting that you know that went around what happened after the Trade Tower uh, the the attacks and what happened to people with disabilities, who was able to get out, who wasn't able to get out, and um, and how we should reconsider our our approaches for emergency evacuations. Um, so we, this project, what I'm going to quickly talk about now is a project that was funded by Accessibility Standards Canada. This is a, a new body that was formed recently with the Accessible Standards, uh, Accessible, uh, Accessible Canada Act coming into force in 2019. Shortly thereafter, Accessible Standards, Accessibility Standards Canada was formed and they funded a number of research projects that will feed into the creation of a series of new standards that are uh, that are in the process of being developed now, in fact. Um, and so our goal was to come up with uh, recommendations for improving aggressibility that get us closer to this ideal of providing equal life safety for all. And the way we approached this challenge was to think about uh, creating a, a really big table, a giant table, where across the top, we have all the different types of buildings that someone might need to evacuate from. And down the side, we thought about what are all the different types of impairments someone might have that might make it difficult to uh, evacuate. And so uh, the, the three big categories that we thought about were mobility, sensory, and cognitive. There has been, you know, I know in the title of this webinar, we talked about mobility impairment. Um, and that is the, the that, that has been a focus of egress, egressibility in the past, I would say the biggest gaps that exist right now might be around how you support people with sensory impairment and cognitive impairment. Uh, so I'll discuss a little bit more about what our report said about that in a bit as well. So this is, this is a simplified view of what our table looks like. This is um, a zoomed in version of one page of our, our table. Um, this one, I'll, I'll take you through this. I know it's pretty messy and a little hard to read, and I apologize for that. Um, on the left here, we again have these types of impairments categorized. In this case, I'm, I'm showing the physical impairment sections. We've divided this up into people who um, are considered non-ambulatory as one category and someone else who might be ambulatory. So someone like my mom who, who uses a cane uh, might fall into this category. And we've looked at the different uh, solutions that could support getting people uh, to safety in those uh, with these, these impairments in an emergency. We've divided them into under three headings, either it's, it's something that helps with notification, something that helps with wayfinding, or something that helps with getting out of the building physically, the egress, uh, or getting to safety in some cases, um, if you consider the use of a, a safe refuge. Um, and then what we did is we evaluated these under four headings. Um, we evaluate each of the solutions for simplicity, affordability, safety, and usability um, for each of the types of buildings. In this case, you're seeing the example that has to do with a high rise, which we defined as 11 or more stories, a building with 11 or more stories. Um, and so we, we, in each of the cases, for each solution that we found or came up with, we uh, rated it on those four axes. So, um, so that... The, the first page I showed you was for physical impairments. This one looks at sensory. This part of the table looks at different sensory impairments and what we need to do for people uh, with hearing impairment, seeing impairment, or someone who might be deaf and blind. Um, you noticed most of our solutions, you might have noticed most of our solutions when we talked about physical impairments had to do with physically getting out of the building. There, we, we, our assumption was that these individuals would not need support with notification of wayfinding. The issue that we're most concerned with is physically moving. 
but on the but for individuals with sensory impairment, it's the notification and wayfinding that that is the the biggest challenges. So we looked at what solutions are out there to support those. Um, and similarly with cognitive or mental health impairments, um, mostly again, looking at notification and wayfinding uh, uh, issues. Um, the fact that we broke these down in these categories does not mean that you couldn't have someone with multiple impairments. Uh, you could certainly have someone with uh, a physical impairment and a sensory impairment, for example, um, it would just mean that these other solutions, a, a combination of solutions would probably be required to support that individual. Um, I'll just quickly touch on a few of the um, kind of areas that we felt were gaps in this table. So we created this big table and we found that there were some solutions in some scenarios, but there were other areas where we saw some gaps. One of those areas that, with gaps um, was, was to do with stairs. And Jim's gonna talk, I know at length about one of the solutions that I think addresses some of these issues. Um, but there are a number of solutions out there, things like evacuation sleds, something that you put someone in that can be taken down the stairs easily. There are evacuation mattresses and slings and things where the idea is it would be fairly straightforward to take someone, to put someone in one of these devices and get them out of the building as long as you're going down stairs. But it becomes ch challenging if you have to go up the stairs. And so if you're, if you're thinking about someone that is below grade and needs to evacuate, get out of the building by going upstairs, the number of solutions drops. And so there needs to be some special attention given to, uh, to buildings where people are situated below grade. The other thing, one of the other big gaps we noticed is that there was a lot of focus on fire. So what happens in emergencies where there's a fire in a building, but many other types of emergencies uh, were not, are not thought about very much. Uh, flooding, power outages, terrorism, earthquakes, uh, in this case, tornadoes. You know, we just had, uh, just what was it, 11 days ago, uh, last Saturday, the, the storm that came through Ontario, for those of you who are local, um, you know, I think 11 people maybe, uh, the last I heard, 11 people died as a result of most of them having trees fall on them. Um, you know, we, we should be thinking about what sort of emergency responses should uh, may need to be put into place for other emergencies, not just fire. Uh, one of the projects I'll tell you a little bit more about the, uh, as, a, as I leave you um, is a uh, is standards for improving accessibility of our national parks. And in spaces like that, we're not only thinking about getting people out of a building in an emergency, it's notifying people that there might be an emergency like a storm coming and where they should be taking shelter in those cases. So getting into a building for an emergency. So I think these are all gaps that we should all be aware of and thinking about. Um, our report also looks at challenges with implementation, planning, preparation, approaches that support these sorts of things. So things like fire drills, uh, things like checking um, the, the pull stations to make sure everything's operating the way it should. Um, are there lists in, in some buildings, for instance, when you uh, become a tenant or you become an owner of an apartment in a, in a high rise building, uh, there will be a management office that will ask you to self report if you require support in the event of an emergency. And so the management office would have uh, some documentation to say that the, uh, in the event of an emergency, first responders need to check on these people because they're, they may be near the refuge areas. If you're going to go with a refuge area solution, um, that, that there's a list of people that need to be accounted for in the event of an emergency or, or people who need to be, uh, need a buddy system. Some people talk about approaches, it's, it's, a, it's referred to as the buddy system where there would be neighbors who would check on other neighbors that might need assistance in the event of an emergency. Um, you know, all of these approaches have, have serious gaps within them that need to be addressed carefully and thought through for every scenario, particularly now in, a, in 
now where people are, uh, whether you're thinking about the egress in a workplace or at home, now that people are working after COVID, people are working more hybrid, it's not always clear who is at work in the workplace. Is there the same amount of support that would be there in other cases, uh, you know, before COVID, the number of people that would be there to support getting people out of the building. Um, same thing in apartment buildings, who during the day, if there was to be an emergency, who would be around that could check on these people? If you're thinking about using a buddy system, uh, the, those people are not always available and, and some backup of, uh, planning approaches probably need. It needs deeper thought. It's not as simple as some of the solutions that uh, as they seem to be implemented in some cases. The other um, area that we looked into was, uh, was implementation challenges. So the way that people seem to approach uh, implementing some of these solutions, for example, the type of product that Jim is gonna talk about in evacuation chair, having those installed at, a, at, at our institution here, I spoke with our uh, fire marshal on site here at University Health Network, and that one of the challenges, so he wanted to uh, purchase some of these and set them up in areas where there were individuals with disabilities that might need them for staff that might need them in the event of an emergency. Um, and, and his approach was to go to our HR department and ask who in our buildings at, UA, at University Health Network might require one of these chairs in the event of an evacuation. Uh, he was told, though, that that information is confidential and that HR is unable to provide uh, that information for privacy reasons. Um, so the approach probably should be planning to have one of these chairs in all, uh, you know, on all floors. I think what what our fire marshal was trying to do was to reduce the cost of this kind of implementation and only put these chairs on the floors where people might actually might need them. Um, but not having this type of information means that the implementation probably requires there to be one of these chairs on every floor or uh, on every other floor so that it's, it's, available to, uh, it's available everywhere where it might be needed. But that obviously means the cost to implement these things goes up considerably. So these are, these are all issues that <clears throat> we found people, uh, like practical issues that people ran into, and it sort of um, led to... Uh, it, it, it became a roadblock that, that the individuals that were going down this path could not overcome because of uh, funding challenges. And so the, our report goes into a little bit of depth on how people should be thinking about uh, addressing these issues. So I'll leave it there. Uh, I, I just wanted to touch on one other thing. This is, this is, our, um, this is the actual report we put together. It was a, a, a team effort. Quite a few people were involved in putting this, uh, this report together. You can access it by going to engineeringhealth.ca, our team website, slash evacuations. That's my email address, tillek.duda at uhn.ca. I'll just touch on one more thing before handing it off to you, Jim. Um, you know, the big picture here, it is, an, it is an exciting time for accessibility because of the passing of the uh, Accessible Canada Act. You know, there, we are actively seeing new standards being written every day right now. Um, what we talked about falls under this subset of emergency, you know, how we deal with uh, individuals with disabilities in emergency scenarios. We talked specifically about egress, um, and we talked specifically about buildings, but there are other issues that uh, are notable gaps in this, in this same uh, type of problem that we're talking about here. For instance, how do you get people safely off ships or airplanes? Current methods are uh, typically require able-bodied people to get off first and people with disabilities are left till the last and we should question um, why the rule, why standards are the way they are in those cases. Um, we also need to think about the, the parks project, parks accessibility project that I described. Uh, we are also highlighting the need for emergency responses in when you're outdoors in parks, particularly someone with sensory impairments. These are things that people worry about, that, that on a, they, they report being worried about when they're out. How, how can they get in touch with someone in the case of an emergency if something happens to them and they need to get help? Or if something is happening around them that they need to be made aware of, how can that happen? Um, and again, the, uh, it, it, the week ago, the, uh, the storm that we had 
there were people that did not receive the uh, alert that was sent out to everyone's cell phones, some of whom might have survived. So some of the people that died might have survived if they had received an alert appropriately. Um, the last little plug I'll make before handing it off is that the Park Accessibility Project is, we're doing a conference at the end of August. Please get in touch if you're interested in, in that as well. Okay, so Jim, I'll hand it over to you. Here's you. the remote. The remote control. There you go, sir. Great. So thanks. Thanks a lot. You're very thorough. Um, I'm going to try to, we may uh, overlap a little bit, but the topic is, is so important that uh, maybe reinforce. And I, I think I'll build off of a couple of the comments that you have made uh, in your part of the presentation. Uh, number one, I should say, uh, I do live in Uxbridge, Ontario. That was hit probably the hardest <clears throat> by the storm last week. Our home, luckily, missed uh, a lot of it but uh it's certainly one of the first times in my life or only times in my life that you actually witness uh, something of that magnitude and in, in emerge in an emergency situation we didn't have uh, any alerts go off on our our cell phones we happened to be further north at our cottage at the time which got hit as well same thing so what talak is uh, mentioning there is is quite important and and uh as we all <clears throat> live in this uh, this world and witness uh, weather change. We believe it's gonna happen more and more. Um, I'm gonna to touch on, uh, so Talak uh, talked a lot about the new standards and planning. I'm gonna to touch a bit of this, obviously around injury and falls prevention, which is what um, uh, Falls Loop is focused on. I'm gonna to touch on that and my history uh, in this sort of realm. I've, uh, for 30 years, I've been a durable medical equipment specialist. I've been accessibility consultant. So this topic was very near to my heart when we started to promote <clears throat> the equipment around it. Uh, Talak and I connected at another conference in the fall and he coined the term everybody out. Uh, we had already coined everyone out and sort of branded it because it kind of came out of my my lips uh, at another conference uh, about four years ago when, when, when talking at another accessibility conference where I was chatting with somebody and said, we do a great job getting people in and around. And as Talak said, uh, but what happens, we need, to, we need to be conscious of the fact that anyone who goes in must come out and we shorten it to everyone out. So I'm gonna move along here. So again, uh, as Talak said, uh, we, we do a great job uh, talking about accessibility and inclusion, uh, well, this uh, basically you're just reaffirming that. Uh, and my history around this was uh, even those who are part and parcel of design and implementation of these things, or accessibility particularly. Uh, sorry, my buttons are a little sticky. Uh, well, we, what I've come up with as well is, is completing that accessibility loop. So again, in and out, up and around, but anybody who goes in has to come out. Uh, okay. Uh, and I think the main challenge as, as Talak has pointed out as well, is when it comes to injury prevention, falls prevention is, is stairs. Okay. Cause stairs are part of our lives. They're everywhere. They're in every building. It's just a, a natural uh, design element that's that's required for for us to live in our multi-layered world that and goes up and not out. Um, so uh, Talak did mention that he's his study looked at any individual with a disability, but we also like to include anyone that has a, a temporary impairment when we talk about planning and getting people out of a building. So that could be somebody, you know, who's in who just has a sports injury or who who is unconscious because of an injury due to whatever's happening in that building. So, uh, or anyone who's aged and too slow that are blocking the pedestrian traffic while you're trying to get downstairs. These are all elements that, of that plan that you have to consider when trying to evacuate quick, quickly as, as well. We, we, we talked about safely and that's important, but a lot of times it's about the speed of egress as well. Come on, guys. There we go. Stairs are, all, again, part of all our environment. So it's not just living space. It's uh, any places that we visit uh, or, or go for enjoyment, education, uh, recreation, uh, worship, 
so these the all these buildings kind of add to a challenge for uh, for the implementation as Talak has mentioned each one of them is going to have a different uh, layer that has to be dealt with and when it comes to planning um, so uh, I've I've pretty much done uh, or I've done uh, projects in each one of these categories and, and can tell you it's 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 a exercise of frustration and a lot of times uh, which is why it's exciting again that Talak's report hopefully gets taken up and it becomes a little more regulated and uh, legislated to basically force the hand of a lot of people to actually go out and, and do something about the plans. Um, so Talak touched on this and we like to reiterate the fact that yeah, our world's changing and it's not just fire. We assume fire a lot of times, but um it, it there's there's all kinds of things that happen in, including the the windstorm from a couple of weekends or last weekend so simply uh just to reiterate the theme uh we want to get everyone out um over the course of me meeting with many many building owners management staff caregivers uh we all know why this is should be a required design element um, nobody is going to dispute the reasoning behind this, but the challenge is to make it front of mind in all aspects of that design plan. And to, to lack in his last few slides mentioned budgets, which I think is over the course of my history, uh, the number one excuse uh, not to do anything. Um, he mentioned uh, privacy issues, which is Kind of a head scratcher just for the record uh years ago i did place about 50 evacuation chairs in the uhn's campuses for patient evacuations so uh it, it just you know when talak told me that story uh when we first met it's it added another layer of frustration to me that these those products have been there those tools have been there uh for a number of years but but sounds like not being really implemented so they went to the effort of getting them, but again, the, the, the internal struggles of, a, of an organization kind of block things. So where does the responsibility lie? And we, as Talak said, there's lots of uh, ways that we can look at tools and planning to make it easier, hopefully. So this is what everybody sees in an elevator and it's very simple that somebody's going to just simply get out of the building we know this is the top of what we're talking about um just a little slight twist on things uh these are some cartoons and uh memes that have come around the world of emergency preparedness people uh this is uh you know their their take on what happens in an actual real life emergency because that's the other thing that we got to consider at, at the height of fear and anxiety in a situation without planning, some of these things become apparent uh, in our modern world. Are we more concerned about telling people via tweet that we are in uh, uh, in the middle of something, or are we worried about uh, executing our plan of escape? My friend uh, Julie Sachuk, uh was injured about 16 years ago while uh, training for a triathlon. And uh, she's helped me demonstrate some of the tools that we're gonna talk about. Uh, Talak has um, mentioned evacuation chairs and we'll show a couple more different products. But uh, I'd like to get Julie's take on her being a chair user and very active. She, visits, she is an accessibility con design consultant. So she's in money buildings. Uh, and uh, this topic in particular, uh, kind of escaped her until I brought it to her attention. So let's just Hi, see. I'm Julie Sachuk. As a result of a spinal cord injury, I have T4 paraplegia, which means I have paralysis from the chest down, and I require the use of a mobility device. When you think about accessibility, it's usually about getting in somewhere or being able to find a bathroom. But what a lot of people don't think about is getting out, especially getting out in an emergency. So when the elevator is not in use because of an emergency situation like a fire, you want to be able to get out and down a set of stairs or up for that matter. 
And that's why it's important to consider in your emergency planning that you have a method for doing that. And that's where something like an evacuation chair comes into play, where instead of having somebody carry or two people carry me and my wheelchair down a set of stairs, I can get out of this chair and safely into an evacuation chair, get strapped in and get transferred down the stairs in a device that's meant to travel on stairs. So I'm going to demonstrate what that looks like, how it transfers, um, and we're gonna try it out in the stairs so that you can see for yourself. So that slide's a little bit longer. We'll show Julie going down the stairs. But uh, just back to uh, the topic, uh, so the National Accessibility Standards to Lacazette, but over the years, there, there are documents and practices and processes that are documented across the country, across the world, uh, citing the need for tools and plans to get uh, those with disability or limited mobility out of buildings. It's just not to the level of awareness uh, or legis legislation that uh, would force the hand of management or government to, to make these a commonplace. So if we look at safety belts uh, being legislated back in the 70s to reduce injury, uh, this is along the same lines as where we're at. Defibrillators in the last several years in certain pockets of the country have become a regular piece of equipment because of the need to reduce cardiac issues. Evacuation chairs and, and equipment, uh, I should just specify the chairs, but equipment needs to be made available at all, all sites. And uh, there's some of the documentation that exists. Uh, just a little bit more. What uh, over the course of, you know, there, Talak mentioned human resources. You're also going to run into uh, interpretations of the building code, the fire code, electrical code, and accessibility code, and how they intermix and how someone's, namely an inspector's interpretation of each of the codes coexists or uh, conflicts with one another. Uh, we also have aging buildings uh, in, in our building stock around the country, and, and they're not compliant to the existing code. So how do you make those uh, A, accessible and B, egressible? And the one thing I do want to spend a little bit more time here on our, our last uh, uh, bit of time is, is the zero lift policy. Uh, you know, where does evacuations fall within those policies? Uh, and uh, this is Julie talking more about the, the importance of uh, and areas of, so we'll skip that. Evacuation uh, chairs work. Just, it's a good one, but uh, we'll skip it for, for the purposes of time. So if we're gonna talk about zero lift and patient, safe patient handling, again, where does that fall in? I was very, um, very active in the early 2000s in Ontario specifically, but this was uh, based off of BC's uh, push in the early 2000s to get overhead ceiling hoist mounted in pretty much every long-term care hospital, care home bed in Ontario Falls and many provinces have done the same with the concept that lifting injuries uh, were uh, precipitated the, the vast number of workers comp claims in those, those environments. So when the idea of the equipment came across my desk uh, probably 15 years ago, when I started paying attention to it, uh, there seems to be a disconnect between a zero lift on a daily basis, which is very important, and what happens when the fire alarm goes off or the, the drill alarm goes off? Uh, do we completely throw those safe handling, safe patient handling techniques out the window and throw somebody on their shoulder and go down the stairs? Or is there an actual plan in place? So uh, I'll carry on on that sort of theme. So again, uh, who has the role? What are the roles and responsibilities? Uh, a lot of smaller care homes assume that their local fire department or first responders are responsible for evacuating uh, their patients or clients, and that's not true. Uh, in the fire code, it's actually stated that first responders deal with the situation first. They have to stop the gas leak, the fire, whatever the situation is first. Now, by all means, they will assist with an evacuation if necessary, but that's not their first order of business. In Ontario, under the Vulnerable Occupancy 
Act, which uh, a couple slides before, uh, it is buildings, uh, and, uh, and I think this is true across the country, I know it's true across the country, it's building management's responsibility to have plans in place, including evacuation of, of persons with disabilities out of their buildings, not the first responders. So that has uh, led to, I'm not going to say conflict, but just a, a con um, conversation around you get these various professions and disciplines uh, within, again, associations or buildings or, 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 uh, or just the, in the whole building uh, planning process or emergency planning process, you know, there's a, there's a sampling of who gets involved. And generally there's a committee uh, who ends up being uh, the key person, which budget does it come from? It could be any one of these particular professions. I, I put security in red because that tended to be a lot of times in big buildings where it became their responsibility by default. So those, those individuals and professionals actually do have uh, quite a big say in how people get out of their buildings. So we'll talk about planning. Uh, sorry a little slow response. Uh, Talit uh, talked about uh, planning. Uh, a PEEP is a personal uh, emergency evacuation plan, and he talked about the buddy system. Um, that's a common practice around the world. There's various uh, forms uh, and, and practices available to us here in Canada. So that's more designed around a employee, student, a, a particular person in a building, an occupant, a, a resident, uh, who needs that uh, special attention. Uh, on a more global uh, scale, uh, I'll give a little uh, shout out to uh, safebuildings.com and, and safesimpletech.com, which is a Canadian local company in Toronto here that has actually digitized a lot of safety plans into a very, when we talk about not notification uh, app, it's a very uh, strong and, and, and usable app that allows uh, first responders to connect to a specific building and, and know where certain people are as as we mentioned earlier in the pro in the process and it's uh it's it's a wonderful device uh talk briefly here now about falls prevention and and as we basically have said we're dealing with stairs we're dealing with gravity we're dealing with uh uh uh, you know, probably the most challenging area in a building when it comes to negotiating it safely at the best of times. Uh, but when we are heightened with anxiety and now have to take responsibility for somebody uh, else, or what happens? So again, just to reiterate, it's, it's any person that could be... Um, in a situation where they're just injured and not necessarily uh, uh, disabled or, or uh, limited mobility, it's any person to get in and out. And what techniques do we use to get them down? Um, is it is it is it one to one in the case of an emergency and in, in low uh, levels of staffing in certain buildings? That's probably impossible. Um, is it a default to a simple let's do what we can to get people out yes that's true this technique is obviously used on a on a temporary basis when people are visiting buildings is it is it a good technique for emergency removal of people or evacuation of people not necessarily here's an example of our of our prime minister from years ago who likes to chip in and that's wonderful but here's an escalator that was uh, down and he's pitched in. But as you can see, this technique is not the easiest or safest way to maneuver in a busy corridor or busy uh, escalator uh, runway. I'm not quite sure how to explain this other than the exception should not be that physical lifting be utilized without specific training. And certainly that's the most dangerous um, place to be. Uh, even this isn't highly recommended for the first responders and prior persons that are gonna be helping you. 
so we have the tools for safe patient handling and how can we incorporate those into doing it quickly? I'm gonna skip a couple slides here to, I'm gonna, for time here. Uh, Talk has mentioned mats and slides as, as, a, as, a, as a technique to get people down. And these are certainly the most affordable means, uh, but I can tell you under practice and trial, um, not necessarily the greatest in terms of being able to prevent injury from your uh, staff or users, uh, because you very much have to, re you're relying on gravity here and you're relying on the strength of the, of the person uh, utilizing the, the tool itself. So we have talked a few times about an evacuation chair, which uh, TALAC study amongst others um, has shown that it is a very simple device and, 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 and worthy of, of consideration. Uh, I'm going to, given our time and we wanna leave some time for question, I'm gonna jump right to Julie's slide showing Julie, I have a couple more detailed slides with videos that will be obviously recorded. Hello, I'm Jim Close from Libby's uh, Incorporated. I'll skip those though, and they'll be available. Julie's gonna join us. So here's Julie just being transferred into the One, two, chair three. and being taken down just to show. So we did- Yes, they have to be transferred Julie out. In. Simple safety belt. Let myself- There is a head it. support here, but Julie doesn't necessarily need it. For those, um, people that we have to move that are unconscious or injured, because we have to think of that as well, there is a head strap. Or if they have spinal injury, you, know, you have to keep them stable. Although this wouldn't be the best device in the, in the case of an absolute emergency, you can strap their heads back and try to keep them stable. But essentially we're ready to descend the stairs. Julie, you okay? Ready. <laughs> okay. So my back casters are locked, I could unlock them. And we're going to go to the stairwell. We're going to go right towards you, Adam. Caroline, can you press the button on the door? So we did the transfer. We did the transfer outside here where we had more space. And clearly that's got to be part of your planning ahead of time as to where the transfers are going to take place. Because in this stairwell, we don't have enough space. But I've used the chair before, so I could probably negotiate this tight little turn. I'm going to bring Julie up here. Julie, you okay? It's always important to make sure your, your patient or your user is comfortable because it is a little daunting. I'm gonna tip the chair up. Okay. I'm gonna kick the back wheels in as we showed earlier. And now I basically got Julie on a four wheel dolly or two wheel dolly, sorry. Okay, Julie, I'm gonna push you down the stairs now. Okay. okay. Okay, gonna give it a push and now we're on. That took a little bit tougher because we have little bumps here, but we're good. So again, we got four points of uh, contact and I'm gonna essentially just push you down the stairs. Keep the camera so rolling, Adam, and I'll go around the I'll corner. I'll let, I'll let myself talk again. And what we'll have to do is take you all the way to the elevator because I'll go all the way down. Okay, again, when we're on a landing, you okay, Julie? Yeah. I'm gonna tip the chair so that I'm free of the wheels, free of the belts. Okay, we're gonna do it again. Okay, give you a good push, get it to here. I move my hands to the top, which I didn't tell you before. So I have my good pushing position. And that's essentially it. So that, that's a quick demo of, of how they work. And they, in an emergency, have, we have great great um, reports back from buildings that are able to move people relatively quickly. The chair itself is about 20 pounds. So once a user gets one person out, they can go back up and get somebody else. One, two. Uh, I'm going to now, uh, Talak did uh, mention things about going up in an evacuation. Uh, there is a power version of this chair. so. Essentially, uh, again, because of time, I'm not going to show the actual video, but it's basically a power tracking chair and there's there's multiple ones available now out there. Uh, but the one thing to consider, we, 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 what is an emergency? Uh, Canada is facing a, a shortage of trained elevator mechanics across across the country. 
and elevators that are aged uh, have to be remodernized and or modernized and it, you'll see at times buildings and including long-term care homes where the elevators are out for months at a time so this essentially is not a time sensitive emergency but it ends up being quite a uh, quite a, an ordeal for buildings who are trying to manage people who need devices and elevators uh, on a regular basis so that's a type of chair that could be used for that situation. Um, that's Julie We've using the power Julie chair, the but we'll skip power. over that again because we're running out of time. We want a few questions, I think. So again, from, from my perspective, the conclusions out of this is everyone out is, is a baseline of, of the thought. It's the goal. We complete the accessibility loop. We know that stairs are an everyday hazard and heightened in times of emergency. We need to understand the roles and responsibilities within a building building staff, building um, committees or, or councils. Understand that uh, if you do know and recognize that people need extra help to, to develop a personal emergency evacuation uh, program profile and uh, be mindful of our zero lift and safe patient handling processes that we already have in place. And there are tools available to, to help with that. Just like the ceiling hoist was uh, introduced years ago and has made our lives easier. Tools like the chairs and the mats uh, are make it simpler as well. So, Michelle, I, I, you know, we're a little, a little bit over our allotted time, but I think uh, we've covered quite a bit here. Uh, we probably could go more, but uh, is that good? We're That's gonna great. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jim. And so, yeah, I'll take over and I'll share my screen. Uh, there it is. So just want to thank you both, uh, Talak and, and Jim, uh, for such a, a great presentation um, and kind of opening our eyes to all the other considerations to keep in mind when we're um, talking about, um, we should talk fulsomely about accessibility and aggressibility. Um, they go hand in hand. So we did have a few participants submit their questions um, through the Q&A box. So we'll get to those in a moment. Um, but first I'll uh, I just want to share a couple of housekeeping items. Um, just reminding folks, um, if you've been on a Loop webinar before, you know that uh, when the webinar is ended, you'll be redirected uh, to Zoom and invited to participate in the short evaluation survey. So uh, if you can click the blue button to continue when, uh, when it pops up, uh, you'll be re redirected to that survey and we really appreciate the feedback. Um, and so I'm gonna open up the questions now. And the first one is from, uh, Joanna, um, and she asked, to what extent is it necessary to organize, coordinate, and plan for community and volunteers to physically be present and available to help individuals evacuate to a safer area? I can start on this one if you want, Jim. Yeah, no, yeah, take yeah. it away. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that it's a great question, Joanna. I think the, um, ideally, you want a solution, you know, accessibility, one of the principles I think that we want to aim for here, a principle is that individuals with disabilities should be able to do things as independently as possible, right? And so you ideally shouldn't, you know, if, if we can get to a place where building codes and buildings are, are, are able to use things like occupant uh, evacuation elevators, uh, where, you know, the, the idea is that you can have, so, so typically in a, in a building, one of the elevator shafts is protected. So in, in the event of a fire, uh, fire, it's normally considered a fire elevator for firefighters to go up and down. But there's actually no reason that you couldn't have uh, specific users like of the building, uh, people that live in the building also use those independently. The challenge might be there's there's a few issues that come up. One of the issues is what if people that don't need the elevator clog it up? So what if other people in the building start using the elevator if it's left open for use for everyone? You have to come. You we might need to come up with solutions that allow you know someone to have a key in the event of an emergency. So people with disabilities that are approved for using the elevator get the the fire key to allow them to use it. That way they could call the elevator, get down and then release it again so that firefighters can use it. Uh, that would be my, you know, the, 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 the first target is, is to try to get people to be able to evacuate independently. So I'll, I'll take it a little, little step uh, further. The, 
the evacuation chairs, we showed a brand there today, our brand, but by and large, they're designed to be, quote, civilian usage. So when talks talking about having them everywhere, if you go to Europe and stay in a hotel, most likely you will see an evac chair somewhere in those buildings because, you know, Europeans are, are that much ahead of us in certain codes. So when you talk about volunteers, uh, defining a volunteer to be that person responsible to come and help in an evacuation shouldn't necessarily be be that. Uh, these chairs are, are simple enough to be intuitively used, and that's the concept. Uh, I understand the, the question, I think, um, because everybody, and, and I saw it firsthand here in my town on, on the weekend where everyone's trying to pitch in, and, and that's wonderful. In a well-run evacuation planned building, uh, the fire inspector does give you X amount of time to evac uh, evacuate. In newer buildings, the fire separations are much more robust and you're able to stay in the building a bit longer, but there's still the concept of getting everyone out, not leaving them in safe res refuge. So that, you know, as much as we talk about quickness and speed, there is a certain amount of time. So these multi-floored, uh, uh, multi-client uh, uh, buildings can take upwards of an hour to an hour and a half to evacuate, but that's under the safe guidance of what the building structure is. Older buildings, a little less so. So do you need volunteers to come and help? Uh, yeah, it's just, it's just a question of, are they trained to in not getting in the way? I guess kind of what Tulak just said about people, the wrong people using the uh, emergency elevators you don't want the wrong people just you know wanting to help but not knowing what to do. So it's a long answer, two long answers to <laughs> to a question. No, that's great. They're uh, I I like to phrase it as fulsome responses uh, rather than a long answer, right? Um, <laughs> and we do have one other question um, with our last couple of minutes, and it's Julie. She says, "I heard that in Ontario there are um, a specific time frame for a person with a disability to be able to exit the building." Um, above that time or more than that time, the person must move to a more accessible place. Is that right? And if so, do you know what the time limit is? I'll take the first part to lock it. I mean, you probably did more studies than, than this, but I mean, the Vulnerable Occupancy Act in Ontario uh, is only aimed at long-term care, retirement homes, uh, care homes, group homes. And the time is not, is not, a specific time. It's based again on on the fire inspector's evaluation of the building, its age, its fire separations, its fire suppression, um, the staff on hand. They have to do those evacuation drill, and then and they have to do drills every six months, uh, where they're using their their least amount of staff on hand, and they must come up with it. So if it is ninety minutes, they have, two staff members, for example, have to be able to do that building. I'm not sure what a uh, commercial building or condominium. Uh, is under the fire code in Tulak. I don't know, you know, would you know that? I, I don't think I, I in any I've of the stuff of we it. did, I don't know if I came across a number, a time limit like that. It's an interesting thought. Like, I guess the question is, Julie, is, is sort of like if you had someone who moved slowly, like my mom, if, if we consider like someone with a bad knee or something going down the stairs, if, if it's going to take them too long to get down the stairs, perhaps they should, then they should go to a refuge is, is maybe there is some guidance on that, but I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I'm not hurt. I'm not aware of a, of a code that, that that specifies that or if it's in the fire code, quite honestly. That's fair. Um, all right, so we've got two other questions that have uh, actually, I guess, comments. So uh, with our last minute, I'll, I'll go through one. I may not get to the other one, but um, Jake Pauls um, says, not a question, more as a comment. There have been, ven uh, been very limited changes in the technologies, strategies, and tactics you illustrated. I supervised United States and Canadian government studies on all of this and more 35 years ago. What has changed is the video and computer, com computer communication technologies today. I hope that with the better outreach now available, you have more luck with implementation than I have seen in decades. Agreed. Yeah, it's a really yeah. good point. It's, a, yeah. it's a, an optimistic- I've done it for 30 years. So yeah, I'm right behind them. I, I, I agree with the, the statement. 
Yeah. It's a good point. Yeah, the, it's good to it's good to see you on here too, Jake. Uh, the uh, yeah, it, it it is like the documents that our team went through. It's it's surprising how date how many years ago you know I was pulling documents from 20, 30 years ago, and they really haven't been saying very much different than what people are saying in the more recent documents. So it's yeah, it, we we need to find a way to 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 actually make the changes happen. Well, the change has to happen by by legislating it. Almost, I hate you know you you, you don't want crime and punishment to be part of the motivation behind things but in a lot of cases that's the way you're going to get things done yeah that's fair well we are at time so i'll thank you guys again um one last time for a great presentation um, and thanks everyone for being here today uh we really appreciate it and uh look for the uh the presentation that recording in your inbox in the next couple of days uh thanks again and have a great afternoon Thanks very much, Michelle. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody.